Welcome to the Healthy School Food Summit, sponsored by Plant Pure and HealthySchoolFood.org, the Coalition for Healthy School Food. I'm Ron Gann, these are your hosts, and today I'm really happy to have Dr. T. Colin Campbell. For decades, T. Colin Campbell, PhD, has been at the forefront of nutrition, education, and research. Dr. Campbell's expertise and scientific interests encompass relationships between diet and disease, particularly the causation of cancer. His legacy, The China Project, is one of the most comprehensive studies of health and nutrition ever conducted. The New York Times has recognized the study as the Grand Prix of epidemiology. Dr. Campbell is the co-author of the best-selling book, The China Study, Startling Implications for Diet, Weight Loss, and Long-Term Health, and author of the New York Times bestseller, Whole, and The Low-Carb Fraud. He is featured in several documentaries, including the blockbuster Forks Over Knives, Eating You Alive, Food Matters, and our own Plant Pure Nation, as well as others. And he's the founder of the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies and the online plant-based nutrition certificate in partnership with eCornell. Dr. Campbell has conducted original research both in laboratory experiments and in large-scale human studies, receiving over 70 grants, grant years of peer-reviewed research funding, mostly with the NIH, and served on grant review panels of multiple funding agencies actively participated in the development of national and international nutrition policy, authored over 300 research papers, and has given hundreds of lectures around the world. He was trained at Cornell University and MIT in nutrition, biochemistry, and toxicology. And Dr. Campbell spent over 10 years on the faculty of Virginia Tech's Department of Biochemistry and Nutrition before returning to Cornell in 1975, where he presently holds his endowed chair as the Jacob Gold Sherman Professor Emeritus of Nutritional Biochemistry in the Division of Nutritional Studies. Welcome, Dr. Campbell. Pleasure to be here. What do you see as the, I guess, the premier approach, if you will, or the best approach, the optimal approach for, for health um, in general? Eat whole, uh, whole plant-based foods, vegetables, fruits, grains, legumes. Uh, the word whole is significant. You know, in other words, the intact food as much as possible. Um, and uh, have, have a good mixture. Don't add back a lot of oil and, sh- and uh, fat, if you will, or, or refined carbohydrates. It's essentially none. That's the goal. How important is nutrition or, or whole food nutrition for, for kids? Well, that's where, you know, they're steady down their lifetime habits, if you will. It's extremely important. I mean, at that age, uh, if children can get into this and enjoy the food, that's it for more or less for the rest of their lives. So, I mean, there's no other group, really, that uh, is more deserving of this information than our children. What have you seen or some of the big issues with kids in terms of, of their nutrition? Uh, the food that they, they get, if they're eating the school lunch program, for example, that food, the first thing that needs to be said is that that food, for the most part, is provided by the U.S. government. And it is a subsidized program. And so schools, I think this rule still applies, but for schools to participate in a school lunch program and get access to that food, which is obviously very affordable for the school system, for them to be able to do that, they've got to offer the dairy option. It's not mandatory, but at the local level, it turns out to be pretty, pretty assertive message. In any case, the food that the children are getting in our public schools is provided by the USDA. That food, that food is being produced uh, with an enormous supply of subsidies. In other words, we as taxpayers uh, putting our money into the government, uh, that money in turn is used to subsidize the production of food for various and sundry groups around the country. Uh, and that includes the school children. So the reason that schools are able to offer the school lunch program, uh, essentially without competition, is because that food is very cheap. And it's cheap because we pay for it uh, with our tax dollars. But in reality, what we're doing, we're basically supporting the food industry, if you will, food production industry, I should say, we're, we're supporting them to produce the kind of food that, quite frankly, is not healthy. So we as taxpayers are paying 
for the school lunch program in large measure. At least we're paying enough uh, to make it uh, to make it go. So there you have it. I mean, in, in, in the schools that for uh, which a lot of children rely on that school lunch program, especially in inner cities and you know, in some other low-income low areas, uh, that food is really important to the life of the child uh, and during the day of the child, you know, during the day. And um, it's the wrong food. It's the wrong food, but it's, it's wrapped up in this really uh, kind of r ridiculous setup that's run by the government. So with the government, subsidizing these programs. Um, so I'm assuming that's why then you don't hear, they're not gonna say anything contradictory to uh, the yes. industries that they're supporting, Absolutely. in essence. Right, right. So, so you've done a lot of work with dairy. You, you just talked about milk, and, and it's one of those things where we know that on average, you have about 25% of the population or more being lactose intolerant. and kids being very susceptible to having a number of issues related to, to, to dairy, one of them being constipation. Very, uh, it's, it's a common situation. And as a, as a parent myself with five kids uh, over the years uh, and uh, grandchildren now, uh, I, I understand that, that issue. What has is, what is your research shown in terms of, of dairy and some of the, the issues with dairy? Well, you spoke of the lactose uh, intolerance uh, issues. Uh, you know, I would hope we wouldn't focus too much on that. You know, for a child to be lactose intolerant, that's really an important uh, sort of, in a sense, a signal that they're not supposed to be eating that food. And for a lot of foods that uh, we might, uh, uh, perhaps we should not eat, when you first eat it, uh, eat the food, you can be somewhat intolerant to it, maybe in even in the form of allergies and things like that. Uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg in a sense. Uh, and the reason I'm making this point is because if it were only a question of lactose intolerance, then you probably know that there's now uh, some pills that you can take uh, to uh, you know, uh, digest the lactose, the milk sugar, more readily. And so that uh, you, you just, and that all happens because of this belief on the part of our entire society that cow's milk is one of the most important foods that a child needs. That, in, a, in the first instance, is not true, okay? Uh, but insofar as the milk itself is concerned, there's uh, several issues, uh, one of which is the fact that it is uh, uh, the leading uh, allergic food, is the leading cause of allergies in children. And I just got that idea affirmed, incidentally, uh, given a lecture at the uh, uh, University of North Dakota Medical Center, where I was speaking, in fact, with someone who's a specialist in that area. Uh, she was a mother concerned with this problem of allergies in her children. And so then when she was at the university as a professional researcher, uh, she's had a chance to really look at the research fairly carefully in recent years. And I specifically asked her, what was her opinion about uh, the chief cause of food allergies in children? She said, unequivocally, it's dairy. Really? That's, yeah, that's not well publicized, but it's something that's really important. It's something that I've been rather familiar with for a number of years, not because we had, you know, mountains of data to demonstrate the point, but I thought her view on that and being an expert in the field, that's what she said. And she's speaking both as a mother, you know, watching her own children have problems, and now as a researcher and teaching. So that's point number one. Allergies, of course, can take all kinds of forms, um, and uh, one of which, uh, uh, you know, the uh, drainage in the ear that a lot of children get, that's one possible possibility. The lactose intolerance is a hint of something similar. Um, and uh, the, the one that I think is uh, most troublesome, but not well enough demonstrated, and no one wants to talk about it, it has to do with the, uh, the, the behavioral problems that children have in school. Milk is generally uh, dairy, if you will, being an allergen that is, uh, you know, it creates these responses. Uh, one of the responses that can be is an effect on behavior um, and learning abilities. Uh, that's a big issue. 
and 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 I have to say it's really unfortunate. There's not been enough really systematically good studies to demonstrate what I just said, but it's really well known by those who are familiar with the field that um, milk can be a source of uh, behavioral problems. That's a, that's just for children's uh, issues. In addition, the milk protein itself. Uh, now has been demonstrated for over a hundred years to be the chief cause of increases in blood cholesterol. More than saturated fat, more than dietary cholesterol itself. It's the animal protein, and the animal protein that's largely supplied for children in the form of dairy, for those children who are consuming dairy, it tends to raise their cholesterol levels, which in turn tends to associate with the development of what we refer to as atherogenesis. That's the beginnings of heart disease. Uh, it also is related to diabetes. So what we see these days, it seems to be getting worse over time, is that younger and younger children are getting diabetes, so-called the, the kind of diabetes that uh, used to be called adult onset diabetes, only for adults. Now we're beginning to see it in children. There is a social with that, by the way. And... Uh, in addition to the rise in cholesterol levels and early atherogenesis and that, that kind of information on the blood cholesterol and atherogenesis, as I say, that, that's been known for over 100 years. And so dairy is in that category, you know, of causing a, a number of different issues. Obviously, it's not going to be a, a switch that's going to turn on problems for every single child. We know that because, you know, all of us are individuals. We're, we're responsive to various and sundry degrees of to the things we ought not to be doing. And, but nonetheless, you know, a substantial number of children are going to experience one of those problems or another. And then on top of it, it turns out, it turns out that the dairy, which allegedly is good for a source of calcium and protein and makes strong bones and all that sort of thing, that's not really true. That's, that's really not true. Uh, in fact, on that question concerning strong bones and dairy, if you will, and calcium intake, the higher the consumption of calcium, if you compare different countries and different societies, the higher the consumption of calcium, the higher is the rate for bone fracture, which is an indication of osteoporosis, for example. So high dairy does not mean strong bones. It's the reverse. So, you know, we got, we got all these issues that are popping up, have been popping up over the years. But unfortunately, it's difficult to talk about this because, uh, you know, that food is so revered by so many people. We thought that was the case for so long. Um, the, the, my own background in this, as you probably know, I was raised on a dairy farm. I milked cows. And so, uh, you know, going away to school, I mean, for me, and, and when I got my graduate work, that was every, it, the idea was to promote more animal protein consumption provided by dairy, for example. And that's what I did. And it was in the Philippines when I started seeing something, you know, rather, rather different from that point of view. What, and then what we've subsequently learned over the years, uh, in this and experimental animal studies for much of that time, was that animal protein casein, the main protein of cow's milk, turns on cancer. It's a very powerful uh, promoter of uh, cancer development in the model that we were using. Uh, so one can say, oh, that's just, you know, th that's just a special case. No, it's not. Because the, the animal protein casein in this case, uh, it's showing properties, biological properties, similar to other animal proteins too. And so it's associated with rising cholesterol in children and adults. It's associated with uh, heart disease. It's associated with cancer now in a number of cases. So I, my view is that if, if there was one food that I would suggest to be the first food to change the consumption of, it would be dairy. And having said all that, you can just imagine, how does that apply to children? Why do we want to, to have children uh, to start you know, consuming dairy as if it's a godsend, if you will? Uh, it's just really ridiculous. Because then they get used to it, and then their, their, their future lives are being cultivated in a sense, you know, to become accustomed to that food. So it's a long answer, but it's a whole lot of stuff there. 
if a school administrator or a teacher or a parent says, my child needs a lot of protein, what do you tell them? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Uh, it also has a very interesting history. Uh, protein, as a nutrient, was first discovered as long ago as 1839. And when it was discovered, it was found at that time by a Dutch chemist to be specific, it was found to actually be needed for normal growth. Uh, you know, in animals, dogs in particular, that was the case. And so, uh, in fact, some of the people who were associated in those early days, scientists were associated with that discovery, uh, they basically said that uh, protein was the stuff of life itself. That's a direct quote. Or another said, it's the, uh, it's what, it's, it's the stuff of civilization. If you, didn't have, if you didn't get protein, you weren't civilized. <laughs> that, that was a story that, that was carried forward during the 1800s, for sure. And at that time, uh, the protein that was being considered and talked about was the protein from animal-based foods. So all of a sudden, I mean, meat, for example, you know, is the source of the really important nutrient called protein. So meat and protein became synonymous, or animal foods and protein became synonymous. Dairy, of course, was a great source of protein. And so through much of the years from about 18, middle 1800s on into the, gosh, 400 years, uh, most people equated protein with meat. They were the same, almost like synonymous words. Meat, protein, meat, protein, that was it. What a lot of people didn't know was that protein is also found in plant foods. That was first discovered, incidentally, in, actually in the 1800s too. But uh, when it was discovered and people started talking about protein being in plant foods and was good enough, and, and, and actually some really significant research was done in the early 1900s to show that plant-based protein made the best athletes, by the way. Uh, that was extensively published by a very famous uh, nutritionist at Yale University. In any case, so the 1900s rolled around, and we were learning that uh, plants had protein. But then this, there was a new twist to the story. That is to say, yes, but animal proteins are higher quality. Plant proteins are low quality. And then it was discovered that this high, so-called high quality was due to the fact that all the amino acids that make up protein, you know, they were required in order to generate good growth on, on, you know, for us. Uh, it was great for pigs and it was great for animals, but, you know, to, in other words, it, the thought came into, into play that we wanted our kids to grow as fast as, we, as they could. We wanted them to be as big as they could. We wanted them to be as muscular as they could. And so the protein story, that myth, sort of became part of that discussion. You know, more protein, animal protein, by the way, because that was high quality. So the whole story about eating animal foods to get the protein was equated with, you know, being smart, equated with being strong, tall, big, right? So it became part of that whole discussion all that time. All the while, during that time, uh, since actually the early 1900s, as early as 1909 to be specific, this, there was evidence arising that plant protein was better, not worse, it was better. And so even when I was in school, in graduate school, and doing my research on protein, trying to figure out how to, you know, produce animal protein more efficiently than, than what we were doing, even at that time, I was very much aware, as we all were, that animal protein was higher quality. It meant faster rate of growth. It meant having higher so-called biological value. You know, everybody wants value. Everybody wants quality. Everybody wants this and wants that. Uh, and so it was all about animal protein, you see. And if you, if you decided to use plant proteins, the idea there was, oh, you know, that's missing one or two amino acids. It's a little bit sh you're shallow on that level. So then we supplement with amino acids, or we would combine plant protein. Always had, so the plant protein idea always was, got, uh, second, was given a second-class status. Uh, now we know, it's, it's more generally known in the society at large even, that plants, yes, they do have protein. And when I got into doing our research over several decades, uh, what we learned was the animal protein stimulates cancer growth. Plant proteins did not. Even when they're fed to the same, same levels as the animal protein, in this case, we're using casein, the milk protein. So uh, 
that's what started to change my views. When I could see that the protein we were using in our experiments, the animal protein caused these problems, plant proteins did not. So then going deeper into the subject, asking questions, well, how much of this, how much of that? It turns out, and this is my view now, and I, I'm really confident of this view, we can get all the protein we need from plant foods. In fact, we get the ideal level of, plant, uh, of protein from plant foods. We do not need, we, we need no protein from animal foods. And a lot of people, that, that strikes them as phony or really rather striking, you know, hardly believable, because here the, all the while they've been thinking, oh, protein is, only protein is only in animal foods. That's what a lot of people have thought. They haven't been aware, really, uh, now seriously aware that uh, all the protein we need is in plant foods. And, you know, we can actually consume uh, plant foods, uh, let's say vegetables, to, uh, let's, just, let's say uh, p potatoes, for example. If we just consume potatoes alone, one of the lowest, has one of the lowest levels of protein, even then we get enough protein. I'm not advocating, you know, eating a total potato diet, obviously, but what I'm, I'm, the point I want to make is that we eat a mixture of fruits and vegetables and grains. We get all the protein we need. That's been demonstrated in spades. There's no question about that. It's indisputable. And so, uh, but we, we don't do it that way. 95% of us are still using animal-based foods. And we do it in large measure, either subconsciously or consciously. We eat animal-based foods in large measure from being told that it has protein in it, among other things. And we need to eat those foods to get that protein. When in reality, the protein in those plant, in those animal foods are doing us a lot of harm. And to come back to athletes, uh, Ron, just for a second, uh, I, I've been involved with uh, several world-class athletes, really world-class, Hall of Fame kind of people. And I will tell you, so, some of these people, uh, these, they have switched and they get better performance. The most recent I, I might mention to you, uh, he doesn't talk about it publicly, but I know, I know his chef, is Tom Brady, the quarterback of the New England Patriots. Uh, his chef took our course and uh, got on to that, and so he started shifting Tom Brady's diet too. Uh, Gary Player, the great golfer, he got onto this right straight off when our book first came out. Uh, Tony Gonzalez, uh, a soon-to-be Hall of Fame player, you know, all-time great. Uh, and runners, uh, weightlifters even, wrestlers, hockey players. Uh, it's, it's truly amazing. So we don't, yeah, I'm sorry to make the, the, the story so long, but we, you sort of have to know that history in order to be able to appreciate, you know, the, the, the biochemistry that we, that we now know. We do not need animal protein, period. Well, in terms of, as you mentioned, a number of athletes, are, the, the new athletes now today, the, the ones that are in the know understand the, the power of using plant-based proteins instead of animal-based proteins. And that's a bit concerning to me considering how much emphasis is placed on our food menu for, for children in schools based on needing more protein. So for instance, the USDA has its requirements, right? Minimum requirements. And right. supposedly our, our menu systems are based off of these requirements. So what do you tell someone who says, well, the USDA has identified this as the minimum level of protein and nutrients, calcium, right? That we need. Uh, and in terms of that, those studies, where exactly do, do those studies then come from what are, what is what is the basis for what the USDA says is our recommended daily allowance I'm going to be blunt about this the USDA is given that's the government agency that's given responsibility for developing dietary guidelines for us citizens right right the USDA the Department of Agriculture they they partner incidentally with the Department of Health and Human Services formally but informally uh, quite frankly, the USDA is calling the shots. In any case, the USDA organizes a committee of scientists to review the data every five years. And they spend quite a bit of effort doing that. And they come up with some recommendations that ends up being the dietary guidelines. In reality, 
first off, the committees that do this, and I know this well because I've been a member of these kind of committees. I've been very much involved in much of that year, at least a few years ago. In any case, the scientists sitting around the table you know, debating the issues, they are well aware. They're well aware that they've got to be careful. They can only go so far. So their own views interpreting the research, I have to say, is colored. It's basically, they're, they're, very, they're almost gun-shy of going too far with issues like this because they know they'll look like, if you will, fools <laughs> in the eyes of some. So the committee does this work. It, it, they put it out. It, it comes up for public discussion to some extent, uh, more so in the recent times. Um, and so then the, eventually it comes back to the Secretary of Agriculture. The Secretary of Agriculture is looking out for the livestock industry. Let's face it. It's a revolving door system where the Secretary of Agriculture may have been the president of the American Meat Institute or vice versa, and they go back and forth. So the, the, the USDA is a livestock-based organization. That's their principal interest. And uh, they, in turn, are then being asked to judge, pass judgment on what, kind, what should be the dietary guidelines. I have to say the whole system is so corrupt it's beyond belief. I do not, I mean, first off, I, I don't think it's reasonable that they should be doing that. They're, they're in serious conflict. But uh, all one needs to do is to look more carefully to see how those numbers and those recommendations come out. That information has been distorted, period. And what, I'm, and what I don't mean to say they've, they've changed numbers or that kind of stuff. It's just the way that, you know, you can pick and choose what kind of information you want to make a certain case. That's what I'm talking about. And so the people, and a lot of very, actually, quite frankly, good people ended up making these really de rather dumb mistakes because they're, they're very much influenced by the political winds of the day. So, you know, even if, they, if, they, even if these committees, um, I've had friends on the committees. I've been on these kind of committees myself. You, you know, you, you just sort of, we're, we're people. We're supposed to be looking at science objectively, but you know, not too many people do that to the extent that they should. They're very much influenced by, you know, the, as I say, the, the uh, dictates of the agency that actually is providing the funding to do that kind of uh, analysis and to do that kind of research. So we're all in it together. Uh, and, and I think that the public needs to know that the US dietary guidelines in my view, are not, they're, they're, they're not the, the kind of information that is the best information we can have by no means. And the USDA is the one that then runs the school lunch program. So you see, it, it's part of a big, big, uh, if you, what, whatever you want to call it. It, it. It's a big paradigm within which we live. I, I like that word paradigm. And it's uh, basically, uh, an area of uh, interest or discussion that has its limits. So how do we change that paradigm? Because you, in fact, many people consider you the, and this is the father of plant-based nutrition science. You know, we have uh, a lot of people that talk about the health side of it, doctors, and we'll have a number of those as part of the Healthy School Food Summit. But it, from a science standpoint, you've, you've, you've seen the research. How does that how do we use that research or get that research out and change the paradigm? That's a really good question. Um, you, you know, you are involved in that too. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a lot of us are, are interested in that question. Uh, there's various ways, and I, I have concerned myself with this question too, just listening to others and, and thinking about it myself. And, and there's various ways I guess we can do that. Uh, I believe that it's, in, in a sense, uh, on, on one, from one perspective, I used to think coming from the top down was a good thing to do and I, because I was working more or less at the top when I was being in these expert panels and things like that. But I was uh, disabused of that idea. Uh, it's really uh, it, it's a, a bottom-up kind of thing. It makes a lot more sense to most people. So uh, talking about bottom-up, uh, you know, this uh, is well or better than I do. That one way is to uh, get uh, you know, at the local level, get some wellness groups going. Uh, you know, in, in your community, you call them pods. And, you know, you, you organize a lot of these that 
then can be connected one with another, especially in this digital age, we can connect them that way. And so they can all get to know each other, they can share ideas, so forth and so on. So I, I think that's one way, just reaching out to the public to get them to learn about this. The, the other way, I'm going to have to go back to my first idea, and that is getting some of the leaders informed. Uh, the reason the leaders, so-called leaders, the politicians, if you will, the politicians are obviously bought and sold, as we all know, and they're very much influenced by, you know, the winds of the day for the most part. Uh, and uh, the public uh, is struggling with this idea. There are a vast number of people in the public are struggling with this idea. And one of the reasons they, they're struggling with is because of things we just talked about, the protein question. Where do I get my calcium? Where do I get my protein? This and that. Uh, the, the third thing is, too, they, they've become, we've all had become addicted to eating the wrong food. That's another issue. Uh, so I, I ask myself, you know, how do you, how do you overcome these they're real, rather momentous, difficult problems from a society point of view? I would argue, and maybe I'm being biased in this case, but I don't think so, that getting the science right is really important. And I, uh, I know a lot of people don't particularly get too excited about talking about the science because they haven't been in science, let's say, they consider all that fancy language, this and that, you know, not exactly their cup of tea. Uh, so they, they shy away from it to some extent, understandably so. But the fact of the matter is, once we get to know the science, then we're in a position to actually challenge some of the things that we have been doing and are doing in a sound, fundamental way. I mean, I, I know in my own career, just being really really loving the science and essentially taking it wherever it took me and uh, got to a place where I never expected to be. And once you get to that point, you can't, you can't go back. You say, oh, okay, all well, that's wrong. No, it isn't. It's, it's, there it is. And so you, you start talking about it and seeing the mistakes we've made, uh, you know, historically, if you will, because we didn't get the science right. And all of a sudden, things start to come into play. And uh, then the, the final... Uh, final test, in a sense, uh, was done by a couple of colleagues, or three or four colleagues of mine, who I didn't know at the time, but they were doing it, not necessarily because of the science. They were just, in some cases, just doing it on, on the basis, of, to some extent, of a whim, or, you know, being intelligent about the subject. I'm talking about people like uh, Dr. Esselton, uh, Dr. Ornish, uh, John McDougall. Uh, they, they were some of the key people I first got to know. I, I mean, I... I came up my own views on the basis of the science. I was sort of, sort of forced to because I had become quite public with some of my discussions. I had to be able to defend what I was talking about. But in any case, then it came to my attention, their work. And so their work was with heart disease, for example, with Ornish and Esselton, or with just general health in the case of McDougall. They, they were taking people and giving them this food for a while, maybe a few days, maybe a month, maybe more. And they were seeing really strong changes that I actually had already concluded from the scientific point of view might work. So in a sense, it was, it was uh, my own background in science, sort of walking through that argument, uh, together with the clinical experience of, of my colleagues. You know, quite independently, we were all doing our own thing. Um, and, uh, and all of a sudden, you got this, you got the, you know, it's right there before your eyes. And so at this particular point in time, I say, the, the simplest thing I can say, you don't need to believe me. You, you can call me a quack, you can call me whatever you want. All you need to do is, I'll give you the food. Just eat this food the way that, that's what Esselton did with his, his patients and McDougall and Ornish. Well, I'll give you the food. You see what happens to you. It's pretty simple. And, and so we finally wrote a book, as you know. And that's what we sort of said in there. You don't need to pay attention to all the science I'm talking about. Just try it for a couple of weeks. And I was, I was pretty confident that it might work that way. Uh, but actually, I have to say, since the book was published, I've been amazed. I'm even more impressed now than I ever was before because now people with all kinds of issues and problems and maybe just plain interest, they tried this here and they say these remarkable results. So coming back to your question, let's get more specific here. So you are involved, as I know, um, you know, these, these pods, great concept. I love that, that, that idea, if we could just make that work. Uh, the other thing, too, is uh, having some food. Having some food that they can actually use 
a lot of people, uh, they, they sort of, this is my experience, they'll listen to me and they'll say, oh, this sounds pretty good, this is interesting, but you know, I don't know how to cook, or I don't know this, I don't know that. Know that. So, uh, but now with this line of food, these frozen food entrees that uh, are up and running, and uh, that's got to be the future. That's got to be the future. Um, and the future is in turn going to depend on people becoming convinced that this is a really good idea. Uh, and they can test that on themselves, and there you go. You have it. It sounds to me like you're saying we have a body of evidence. Right. All double peer-reviewed. Not just uh, We're talking about 100 years plus of science, not just in That's the right. past 10 years, it's right? A lot, of, a lot of stuff. It really is. Right. So we have this body of knowledge. Then in order for this to be accepted, especially for schools, schools are all about education and science, right? Everything is, it's, that's what we, we, we try to promote the, that approach. Then we have to walk the walk, take the science and educate our leaders. And then also the bottom up approach, educate uh, just people in general to understand so that everyone is educated based on the science. And then the second piece of that is that they had to experience it. Here's the science, you know it. Now experience a whole food, plant-based lifestyle and see what the, and, and so you can validate this, the, uh, the science itself, you know, b validate it for yourself. So it's that to educate and then experience. Right, you put it well, exactly. It's gotta be a, a, a total, uh, total perspective on this whole thing. And of course, you know, in that kind of discussion, you, the point you were just making, We've got other issues here that we can sort of get interested in too. The cost of health care right now in this country, we all know, is through the roof. It's higher than any other country in the world, by far. I mean, my God, this, this is ridiculous. That's one issue. Another issue is uh, the environment. My gosh, the environment has become a looming, it's big. That's a big story. And so you, you bring those two thoughts into the, into the discussion, those two problems into the discussion. And, and then there's a third one, of course, is is basically animal welfare, which driven the interest of a lot of people. It's very convincing for, you know, uh, a certain number of people. It'd be nice if more were interested in that, but still, I mean, it's a it's a limited group. And so, you, you, but they're all part of this same story, and that, and and science serves them all. Science serves them all. I mean, get the science right. Really understand, you know, what what is a nutrient? What's in food? How does that get translated into health? or disease, as the case may be. You know, how does that work? And once you get into that, in that space, you realize, you know, you, it's, uh, it's really the ground rule stuff. It's the very basic information. And um, I, I don't know, I think, uh, you know, you've got top, middle, you say, uh, down. I mean, that all comes from a good solid. It's got to come from a good solid base. A base. It's got to come from a good solid base of information in order for it to last to go into the future. And then you discover, as I said, you discover these other problems that could be resolved if we just ate the right food. You know, we can begin to resolve the, the, the environmental problem. That's World Bank stuff. I, I worked with them some years ago, you know, and, and the, the amount of uh, climate change that's caused by livestock, for example, is a big issue. You know, a lot of people, even the ones who are opposed to the thought, still have to accept it, like the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, for example, or, or the cost of health care. Right now, we're talking about the, the, the Affordable Care Act, the so-called Obamacare plan, and, and I'm participating in that to some extent, to the extent that I can, and you've got two sides, yelling and shouting and shouting. It's a shouting match. It's not, a, it's not even a debate. It's a very politically charged shouting match. And neither side is talking about the thing they need to talk about. How do you reduce health care costs by informing people about nutrition and about what this is all about? That's another whole issue. The subject of nutrition itself is the kind of science I'm talking about. And it's not taught. Just the medical system, for example, the, the doctors who are our leaders, should be our leaders, will be our leaders in the healthcare sector. There's no question about that. I think we'd all agree to that. They're the ones that's going to be out there in the front talking to patients. They're the ground, they're the troops on, 
you know, on the, on the ground in this message, no medical school teaches nutrition, except for little dribbles here and there, but they don't teach nutrition, number one. Number two, uh, we don't do research in nutrition, not the kind I'm talking about, really. Uh, and, and to give an example of that, the National Institutes of Health, NIH, has got 28 institutes, one for cancer, one for heart disease, one for this and that and everything else. We don't have an institute of nutrition. Why? Same, why, why is it we don't have an institute of nutrition? Well, all of those, our entire medical system is founded on uh, what I call reductionist ideas. We're always working with very specific things. We work with pills and procedures. You know, we focus one thing at a time. And so we, we believe, we, we now have this fancy term called targeted drug therapy. You know, that's the big mantra. You read it in the newspapers almost every day. The pharmaceutical companies are coming forward. The entire pharmaceutical industry is, is functions on the grounds that they want to find a specific chemical to deal with a specific issue after you have the issue, after you have the disease. That's wrong. Fundamentally, that doesn't make sense. And what they're leaving out of, that's a reductionist approach. You're working with the details. Targeted stuff. When we actually should look, be looking at the whole, not, not these little detail stuff. And so the medical system is focused on reductionist practice. They're paid for that. As a matter of fact, of this, the 120, I think it is now, the 120 medical specialties that doctors can check off when they're you know, working with the patients and, and the mechanism for, by which they get funded and so forth. 120 medical specialties. Do you know that nutrition is not a single medical specialty? Really? The single most important of all, and they will not do it. So, you know, they don't have a medical specialty. The, the, the NIH has, 18, has 28 institutes and not one is devoted to nutrition. And thirdly, medical schools don't teach it. To me, that is one of the, that's the story of our time. The fact that nutrition as a science, that's what I'm talking about. Nutrition as a science is not being introduced to the professionals, period. And one of the reasons for that, if you start asking questions about, well, why is that so? I, I just been uh, writing some papers on history going back to the 17 and 1800s on this question and where this idea started from, this, uh, so-called reductionist idea. It's a fascinating story, by the way. Uh, I got involved in doing that 30 years ago when I was at University of Oxford in England. But uh, we've lived with this magic bullet. Let's call it magic bullet idea. You know, we, we, uh, we eat the wrong stuff. We do this, we do that, you know, and, and uh, we get addicted to these food tastes. That's a big deal. And we get sick. We have problems. So now we're gonna solve our problems by going to the doctor and let the doctor poke and prod, prod us and give us his pills because that's what we expect to have to make us well. We might see some relief of problems, of course, from time to time. That's not an issue. I mean, that's not, that's not in question. We might see some relief, obviously, relief especially in the area of pain. And, and, and antibiotics, you know, they, they certainly can knock out some organisms that are hanging around we'd rather not have and if they're serious. And so, you know, I don't want to be totally anti drug obviously but because they're, they're useful at times but um, that's not the that's not the message that we need to know in order to be healthy for a long you know health have a healthy long healthy life uh, and I'm 83 I should knock on wood I guess in, in some ways but I don't take any any uh, drugs Karen doesn't take I don't take drugs don't take nutrient stuff and forget it you know those see that's a reductionist idea that's reductionist, that's a pressure reductionist message. Nutrition is a holistic message. It's everything working together. How can they teach that when, it, you know, it's difficult. Come back to your point you made before, top to bottom, and the whole thing. Actually, what I would say, both are needed. You know, we need the holistic. We need the, we need the broad, uh, broad perspective. We have, clearly, we need to understand that uh, on the one hand. But we also, it's nice to have some of the details to see how that sort of, it gives some granularity to our argument. You know, it, it gives, it, it, it's, it's the trees in the forest. And, and unfortunately what we're doing, we're working with trees and even uh, worse, we uh, spend our lifetimes making, maybe working with one kind of species of trees, maybe one, one kind of cells in the trees, you know, one kind of enzymes working in those trees. 
you know, uh, so we, we, we go real, real deep into the subject. There's a lot to do on a lot of different levels to, to enact change. So given all your experience within, you're, you're talking years and years, like I said, a lot of us consider you the, the, the father of plant-based nutrition science. And as we said, science is important to the foundation of the, for, to educate people, to get them to experience it, and ultimately to support and promote this lifestyle. Uh, as, we, as we're talking about kids here, we've seen such, the impact is huge in terms of, uh, we talked about healthcare, the trajectory that we're on right now is unsustainable. Right. And if the kids, if our own kids, the, this generation isn't prepared, doesn't understand the science, doesn't understand the, the, the power right. of nutrition, we're, it sounds like no matter, it doesn't matter what health care law you put into effect, it's a slippery slope. All we're doing is whether you say pay less or pay more for health, at the end of the day, we're going to have more sick people in the system, in which case there is no, we do not have unlimited resources. It doesn't, it seems like there's no, no win here. Yeah. Not, you just touched on something. I don't know whether you agree with this or not. It's kind of political, but I, I'm not a big fan of regulations and, and uh, you know, more of that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, that can sometimes do more harm than good. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, government intervention to, into this question uh, from that perspective is, is not exactly the right way to do things. I, I think on the other hand, the government, though, does have a responsibility. At least in my case, this is my experience. They have a responsibility to share with the public the information that they bought or they paid for. I mean, all of my research, 100 percent was uh, from the taxpayer. And so in that case, the taxpayer has a right to know what we did with their money, right or wrong. They have a right to know. And quite frankly, the government, working with, together with industry, it's a cabal, it's a combination. We're working together. Uh, they're denying the public this kind of information that they paid for. So that's another, that's another story. But, you know, so I, I think that to come back to, I think, the main point we were talking about before, we probably would agree on this, that it's, it's a question of how to inform the public. How do you give, you know, how do you give them a chance to try it? You know, having food is one way. Uh, informing them, yeah, you get a bunch of people all over the place from different communities talking to each other, you know, about, hey, I did this, I did that. Here's what we saw. We all saw the same thing. Well, it got better. Isn't that kind of exciting? We, and we, and we, we don't pay much money for uh, pills and procedures. That's a pretty neat idea. You talked about nutritional science. And I see nutritional science as important to educate leaders, to educate parents, to educate teachers, but also to educate students. And it's one thing to serve healthy school food, but if, and to make it available to, to students. But if they don't understand and it's important, if they don't understand the science behind nutrition, as you mentioned, there's, there are a number of other disciplines out there that we teach. Why not teach nutritional science in schools? Wouldn't that help to increase the adoption rate of the food itself served in, in the school? Uh, one way to, to do this kind of thing is that, uh, you know, my, one of my former students did a PhD with me, uh, Dr. Anthony Adimus, uh, and has done this for a long time. And uh, she did for her PhD thesis, actually, work in the schools, in an elementary school, working with kindergarten, first and second grade children. And, and just put them on this kind of diet, showed them, you know, where food comes from. It was very successful in doing that. Uh, her daughter now is doing it in Baltimore in several school systems there and maybe transformed the whole city of Baltimore. Uh, Amy Hamlin is doing, you know, a great job in New York City, you know, uh, doing what, uh, what she's doing with, with that too. You know, these kind of efforts that are being made to get into the schools and, and just – Giving, this, giving the children some hands-on opportunities of working with food, They're cooking together even, cooking together and, and then talking about where does the food come from? And that gets into issues concerning some discussion of geography and different ethnic, ethnicity. 
give them ethnic cuisines and stuff like that. You know, even you can bring in some math and so forth to do, do an, make it part of the curriculum. But it's kind of, I think uh, they can say it better than I can say it, but just getting the hands-on work. <coughs> We're using the basic sciences. That's one way to learn it. They don't need to learn all about chemistry and biology. And stuff. It's too early. <laughs> too early for that. But they'll, they'll get there. And uh, they'll discover that the food is good. That's already been shown. If you take children and let them try it, and they're part of it, part of the educational process, it's really surprising. You know, us adults write off to children too quickly sometimes. They're really quite intelligent. And uh, they can pick up stuff like this in a hurry. And they share it. I think we, we educate and they experience it and then they share it with their friends, with their family. Right. That right there, educate, experience, and then share uh, right. yeah. is a key process. That, to me, to implement plant-based nutrition I think so. uh, in, yeah. in, in the school system. So I really appreciate your time, Dr. Campbell, and, and helping us out here with the Healthy School Food Summit. And I appreciate the audience being here with us. If you want to learn more about Dr. Campbell's work with the Center for Nutrition Studies, just go to nutritionstudies.org uh, to learn more. And also you can learn more about the Coalition for Healthy School Food at healthyschoolfood.org, as well as Plant Pure. We're both co-sponsors of the Healthy School Food Summit. And Plant Pure's website is uh, plantpurenation.com. Again, thank you, Dr. Campbell, for all the work that you do for us. Thank you for having me. Enjoy it.